For the people of Europe, the long wait is over. The tension, the fear, the anxiety of a decade has lifted. The pace of history had accelerated in the last year, taking the continent on a roller coaster ride of emotions. In 1938, Britain had feared war, issued gas masks, and called up reserves as Hitler took the continent to the brink of conflict over his demands that Czechoslovakia's German minority, the Sudeten Germans, be incorporated into a greater Germany. The democracies of Britain and France met with the dictatorships at Munich in perhaps the first modern summit meeting. The result is a settlement dictated to the Czechs that gives Hitler all he desires. The people of Europe rejoice at the news, believing a new order has come to pass, one that promises a lasting peace, with a commitment by the great powers to negotiation, not war. The continent believes Hitler has no further demands. The Sudetenland joins the Reich. The illusion of success crashes to ruins within months. The remainder of Czechoslovakia is torn apart, divided by avaricious neighbors orchestrated by Germany. The Nazis now target their ambitions upon the state of Poland, demanding the return of German territory given to the Poles after World War I. These demands conceal a dark strategy of endless German eastwards expansion, the product of an insatiable hunger for land to be taken from Slavic peoples thought inhuman by Nazi ideology. There can be no compromise, no appeasement. Unlike the Czechs, the Poles refuse to bow to Hitler's demands. Britain joins France in making an alliance with Poland. The final connection of the path to war is made by Joseph Stalin. The Soviet leader makes an alliance with Hitler. The deal gives Hitler a free hand to destroy Poland. The communists are rewarded with half of Poland, pushing their borders westward. In just weeks, the Polish state is torn apart, destroyed either subsumed into the German Reich as German territory or subjected to the darkness of occupation by either Nazi or Soviet troops. The Allies stand helpless as the country they promised to aid is overwhelmed. Modern armored and mechanized armies sweeping aside the cavalry and foot soldiers of Poland. Then, nothing. After weeks of furious fighting, calm descends on the continent. The time that followed the destruction of Poland in just five weeks of frenetic activity came to be called the phony war, the war that wasn't really happening. Now imagine me in the Maginot line, sitting on the mine in the Maginot line. Now it's turned out nice again, the army life is fine. French the phrase was coined in the United me. States. I'm not Britain French, talked about the Boer see, War and the Twilight War. Say, we, we, the French talked of La Grande de Guerre. In Germany, they called it the Sitzkrieg. France and Britain demonstrated their decision to end appeasement and honored their decisions to aid Poland. But the democracies did little to actually help Poland in any material way. They did little that could indirectly help the Poles by distracting or diverting Hitler's attention. France's commander-in-chief, Gamelin, saw the war only in terms of defending France, repulsing a German attack. This mentality spread down throughout the French army. No attempt was made by France's heavy artillery to shell German industrial towns, which were well within range. Small probing attacks were made into Germany. When the French reached the Siegfried Line, fortifications which were the German equivalent of France's Maginot Line, they stopped. The inactivity, the passive waiting, sapped the moral strength and the will of the French army, demoralizing the many thousands of reservists summoned away from their civilian lives. 
Britain proved equally reluctant to engage the Germans. Britain, in particular, was seized by fear of air raids. A proposal by the RAF to set alight the Black Forest was rejected, the bombing of German arms factories forbidden as an attack on private property. A proposal by Churchill to mine Germany's rivers, important arteries to the economy of the Reich, was rejected by both Britain and France on the grounds that reprisals might be provoked. The first death of a British soldier did not occur until December 1939. This was in severe contrast to World War I, when, in the same time, 50,000 British servicemen had died. It's no surprise that the war seemed phony. The public mood of determination and resolution that had swept the democracies when war broke out gradually faded away. The willingness to resist an expected immediate attack melted into boredom. The blackout, the rationing of food, the evacuation of children far away from home, the closure of places of entertainment became irritations. The numerous emergency laws passed in the first months of the war imposed controls and interferences on and into everyday life that seemed pointless and irrelevant. It was not just Allied passivity that created the phony war. The Germans were in no great haste to raise the pace of the action. They sought to consolidate their gains in Poland. Some German generals thought the army not ready for war and hoped, as many did in Britain and France, that the war might wither away and a peaceful compromise emerge if neither side upset the other. Perhaps another reason for the phony war is the simple fact that the weather of that winter was some of the most severe in living memory. It was only upon the oceans did the war seem real, not phony. Germany's naval strategy was to attack enemy ships wherever possible, using both surface raiders and U-boats. In the very last weeks of the peace, numerous surface ships had slipped out of German ports and disappeared into the expanse of the ocean. The entire U-boat fleet put out to sea and took up position in the Atlantic. As war broke out, immediate attacks began upon merchant shipping with clashes between the naval forces. The anchorage of Scarborough Flow in Britain's far northern Orkney Islands was used as a forward base by the British fleet in attempting to seal the North Sea. On the night of October 13th, a German U-boat daringly entered the anchorage and torpedoed the huge British battleship Royal Oak which capsized with the loss of 833 British sailors. In the coming war, the U-boat and the aircraft carrier would become the dominant weapons of naval warfare. But the first encounters of the war at sea involved surface action. Germany had built a fleet of large ships, surface raiders, designed to make long cruises into the oceans, sinking and destroying merchant trade. One such ship was the Admiral Graf Spey. She had sunk Allied shipping in the Indian Ocean and off the coast of South America had fought a battle with British forces, which she had powerfully outgunned. Engine problems forced the Graf Spey to take refuge in the neutral Uruguayan port of Montevideo. In classic subterfuge, the ships of the Royal Navy used false signals to convince the Germans that a massive British fleet was assembling over the horizon. The Germans chose to scuttle the Graf Spey. The encounter was presented to the British people as a great victory.
the Graf Spey had taken many British prisoners and transferred these to her supply ship, the Altmark. Altmark was cornered off the coast of Norway and took refuge in neutral Norwegian waters. A team of British Marines daringly stormed the Altmark, the British themselves violating Norwegian neutrality and rescued the prisoners. Britain had learned some of the lessons of World War I and immediately introduced convoys against U-boat attack, resources restricting the extent to which escorts could be provided. Churchill, as Britain's first Lord of the Admiralty in charge of Britain's Navy, showed the wild, maverick side of his nature, insisting that defense measures were not enough and demanded search and destroy patrols be launched against submarines. This was against all advice that this was proven to be a poor way to deal with U-boats. Churchill rejected the advice of the admirals. The result was that the British aircraft carrier, the Courageous, was sunk and another badly damaged. War was being fought on land, in Europe, in the forests of Finland. The global conflict that became World War II was, in many ways, a number of small wars that broke out at the same time and aggregated together. One such conflict was that fought between Finland and the Soviet Union. The fighting that broke out at the end of November 1939 was the direct outcome of the Nazi-Soviet pact in which Stalin demanded Finland become part of Russia's sphere of influence. The fighting was a result of Finland's rejection of Stalin's demands that their shared frontier be moved further into Finland and that Finnish islands be given to the Soviet Union. The Russians feared invasion and wanted to push their borders further west as they had done in Poland. Stalin was prepared to offer compromise, but the Finns saw the USSR as an implacable enemy and believed that concession would only bring further Soviet demands. Russian forces attacked across the whole length of the border. The Soviet Union mounted a full invasion of Finland. The Russian soldiers were told that Finnish workers would rise to welcome them as liberators from capitalism. The Finnish army was small and poorly equipped in nearly every aspect. However, its troops had been intensively trained to operate in their native forest terrain, to operate in the dense woods of summer and the depths of winter snows. What's more, the Finnish soldiers were motivated by a fierce and determined patriotism. The Russians outnumbered the Finns by more than 150%. Their imagined easy advance ended in stalemate the Finns absorbed and repulsed repeated attacks, and the Russian superiority in air forces was negated by the short Arctic winter day and poor weather. The Russian tanks were negated by a simple improvised weapon, the Molotov cocktail, a bottle filled with gasoline and tar, which was thrown into tank engines, setting them on fire. The communist tactics were naive, separating their tanks from their infantry. The Russian armor was hunted down amongst the forests by Finnish infantry on skis. The Russians attempted to swamp the Finns by weight of numbers, using crude human wave mass attacks. The result was massacre by machine gun fire. Throughout the Finnish war and the early stages of the eventual conflict with Nazi Germany, Soviet forces would be severely weakened by the butchery of Soviet high command in Stalin's purges. The communist dictator destroyed the leadership of his army through a paranoid fear of plots and planned coup d'etat. Incredibly, the Russian forces had no white winter camouflage or winter survival skills and simply froze to death through the absence of winter clothing.
Finland appealed to the League of Nations in its last major intervention in world affairs, the League proved as impotent as ever to prevent the war. The USSR was expelled from the League, and all member states urged to support the Finns. With Germany supporting the Soviet Union, such help the world could give Finland had to pass through Norway. So tortuous was this route, the Finns had to fight alone and unaided. As 1939 passed into 1940, the Finns turned to the counterattack and won a series of stunning victories against the Soviets. Whole divisions of communist infantry surrendered and vast numbers of heavy weapons were captured and turned on the Russians. The Finnish successes brought the Russians to the negotiating table. They also made the Finns believe that ultimate victory was possible and led them to push for a hard bargain with the Soviet Union. These tactical successes were a distracting illusion from the true strategic position that Finland would, in the long run, be crushed by the sheer weight of her larger neighbor. Finland was falsely encouraged by a British and French plan to aid Finland. In reality, this was a plan to seize neighboring neutral Sweden's iron ore deposits. The Finns judged that it was not a serious offer that Britain and France would really carry through. In the time being, as the negotiations persisted, the Soviet army reorganized and mounted new heavier attacks. The Finnish army could take no more and in the end crumbled. Early in March 1940, the Finns signed an armistice with the Soviets in Moscow. The USSR could have pushed on to total victory and occupied the whole of Finland, installing a puppet communist government, yet they did not. They accepted territory, more than they originally demanded, but still leaving Finland's democratic institutions and the bulk of her territory intact. It may be that the Soviet Union wished to avoid war with Britain and France and wished for freedom to negotiate in the new Europe. In fighting Finland, the Soviet Union lost more than 200,000 men to the Finns' 25,000. The Red Army lost credibility and its final success was ignored by the world. The war drove Finland democratic nation, a natural ally of Britain and France, into the arms of Hitler. As soon as the peace between Russia and Finland was concluded, secret approaches were made by the Nazis who saw Finland to be an ally in the coming final conflict, a war of destiny to destroy Soviet communism. Germany supplied Finland with new modern equipment and the Finns rebuilt a modern army and planned for revenge against Russia. The armies of 1939, the armies which took their place in northern France, represented a way of fighting war, a relationship between the armed forces and society that is almost impossibly remote to the present. The British force that was slowly, unit by unit, being ferried across the channel to the fields of northern France, went under the title of the British Expeditionary Force. It went under the same name as that borne by the British Army in the First World War. The Army resembled that of 1918 in more than just name. In appearance and mindset, in philosophy, in the mental framework of the senior officers, it was a war equipped to bring victory in 1918. It is a fact of military history that victorious armies prepare for their next war by anticipating an exact replica of the past. One of the first acts of the army was to prepare trench lines, constructing the defensive positions which had dominated the fighting 20 years before. Initially in the month following the outbreak of war, the BEF comprised of little more than 150,000 men. It was placed along the Belgian border between two French armies and under the overall command of French generals. 
In addition, an expeditionary air force was created by the RAF. This had just under 10,000 men with 12 squadrons of aircraft. This BEF was modern in that it was motorized. Its troops traveled on trucks, not marched on their feet. Its heavy artillery, the big guns, weren't towed by horses. They were mechanized. But the BEF was not an offensive force that could carry the war to Germany. Its strength was diluted, not concentrated into specialized armored units, as had been so powerfully demonstrated by the Germans in Poland. It lacked adequate communications. It was poorly trained. The air component was weak and not integrated to supply any real support for the army. dug trenches, caught up on training, and waited to see what would happen. In the spring of 1940, the BEF was supplemented by territorial units, reserves of part-time soldiers. Its strength then began to approach 400,000, but nearly half of these troops were little more than labor, had little military value, and almost no equipment. The BEF conformed to the traditional pattern of what Britain expected of its soldiers. Traditionally, the British Army was small and used to police less technically sophisticated civilizations within the worldwide empire. A small number of disciplined soldiers with technically advanced weapons were able to control large subject populations. The soldiers that manned this army were by tradition professionals, seeing soldiery as a job rather than a patriotic duty. Tanks had been one of the most startling innovations of the First World War. They had developed from agricultural tractors as armored vehicles to cross the morass of no man's land into the hail of machine gun fire that had made conventional charges by infantry with bayonet and by cavalry with sword or lance bloody killing grounds. Tanks had played significant roles in the great victories of the British in 1918. But amidst the confusion of the war, to read the true potential of the weapon required a leap of imagination that was made difficult by the Allied victory. The British Expeditionary Force was a conventional, traditional army that simply added tanks to the normal structures. The thinking that guided the BEF was the product of severe debate between the wars on what a tank could do. Those who argued for all armored formations as adopted by Germany were sidelined and defeated. So the BEF was an army where infantry fought on foot, guns were towed to battle and dug in for set-piece bombardments, and cavalry, although now in armored vehicles, used lightly armored vehicles that would enable them to fulfill the cavalry role of scouting and pursuit of defeated infantry. Tanks were attached to the infantry to allow foot soldiers to cross no man's land. The British Army traditionally was small and professional. France had a different relationship between soldier and state. The tradition of the citizen in arms that dated back to the revolution remained. As a continental European power with borders with aggressive neighbors, France had traditionally maintained a large army based upon conscription, upon national service, upon the duty of the citizen to the state. Once again, in 1939, their army had been called up, reservists mobilized. It was a massive force of nearly three million that stood alongside the British army. To create this vast army, France had relied on each generation of its young men passing through conscripted national service. The bulk of these vast numbers of reservists were placed in the uniform with just a single year's training, as much as 10 or 15 years previously. 
In terms of military thinking, the French had failed to learn the lessons of World War I, as had the British. French tanks were over 3,000 in number, the equal of those in the German army, and were technically high in quality. But they were designated to accompany infantry, not to act as an independent strike force. The army as a whole was poorly equipped. France was unable to bear the economic cost of supplying such a huge force with mechanized transport. Most of France's guns were towed by horses. They were still horse cavalry regiments. The infantry marched on foot into battle. Orders were sent by messenger, not by radio or field telephone. The nation which went to war was, however, confident of victory. Opinion polls of the citizens that were soon to wear uniforms showed that 75% of France supported military action against Hitler over Poland. Generals have always stressed the need for focused goals. In this, the French army was devoid of inspiration. Its only goal was to resist. France's army thought the lesson of World War I was that the defense held the upper hand in combat, that the machine gun, in entrenched positions, could defend against battalions. This had been the hard-learnt lesson of France's Western Front. For the French soldiers defending their country's western borders, the defining moment in the history of World War I had been the Battle of Verdun, a complex of forts on the Western Front that had been resolutely defended to the death, with hundreds of thousands of casualties on both sides. France saw the path to victory in 1939 as making their whole country into a new Verdun, against which Germany could be provoked to attack. Attacks which would break against the fortress walls so decisively that German strength would be destroyed. This tactic produced the Maginot Line of Forts, a fantastic complex of defenses. In the spring of 1940, the British Army also sent troops into these forts, and many of the fortifications which British soldiers hastily dug and reinforced were attempts to extend the Maginot Line towards the sea. Economy had ended the line at the Belgian border. Britain and France were both centers of large worldwide empires, and often the soldiers both countries deployed were troops from those empires. Indian troops were to be seen in the fields of France as part of the British Army. France deployed many troops from its Army of Africa. Some of the forces that were being assembled against Germany were Poles, who had undertaken incredible journeys, escaping via Hungary, Bulgaria, Turkey, and the Middle East to somehow link up once more with their British and French allies. A definitive mission of the phony war were the raids which the British and French air forces did mount against Germany. These were raids of leaflets. In the early months of the war, Britain in particular clung to the belief that Germany might still be persuaded to listen to reason and negotiate a peace. For several months, the Royal Air Force scattered leaflets all over Western Germany, setting out a logical, reasoned case against Nazi expansion into Europe. There appears to have been no effect on public opinion in the Third Reich. The only value of the raids was in training crews in navigation over Germany at night. Neither German, British, nor French air forces sought combat during the phony war. Attacks were made on shipping, and photographic reconnaissance was made. If, during the phony war, the events on far distant oceans and peace on the supposed battlefields of Europe seemed remote and disconnected from the everyday experience of the population, 
so too must have seemed the far distant events of Asia. Few Europeans may have given much thought to the vicious war that was being fought in China by the army of the Empire of Japan. Little did the people of Europe envisage that the war in Asia would link together with the fighting in Europe. Japan was fighting to occupy and control the resources of China, a vast but weak and chaotic country. Japan sought to eventually replace the European powers as the imperial master in Asia. European colonies, such as Hong Kong, strengthened their defenses, fearing the war might spread across from China. That war was itself a complex tangle of wars, a conflict within conflicts, China fought Japan, but within that war, two Chinas fought Japan. The Nationalists, the official government of China, and the Communists, the alternative government. Within this war, the Nationalists and Communists continued their own civil war. Japan pioneered the strategy of extending the war to the whole of the enemy, both civilian and soldier alike. A series of brutal campaigns from the air and the ground massacred innocent civilians to intimidate and cow the Chinese population. On March 7, 1940, the Queen Elizabeth, then the largest passenger liner in the world, completed its maiden voyage, docking in New York. The liner had dashed across the Atlantic at top speed. The voyage was kept a total secret. The ship had traveled alone, without escort, relying on her high top speed to outrun any possible attack by Germany's U-boats. She was sent to New York to complete fitting out and escape attack by air raids. The enormous size of the liner and her high speed made her as potent a weapon of war as any battleship, delivering the resources of war in vast quantities. In the coming years, she and her sister liner, the Queen Mary, would make any number of high-speed journeys across the ocean, always alone, always in top secret. In April 1940, the phony war disappeared and broke into real action. Germany mounted an invasion of the neutral Scandinavian country of Norway. Hitler saw Norway as a weak northern flank. The remote port of Narvik in the far north of Norway was the outlet for Swedish iron ore, essential for the German war effort. During the Finnish-Russian War, France and Britain had planned to seize the port and deny it to German shipping on the pretext that they were aiding the Finnish fight against Russia. This scheme was abandoned after the Finnish collapse against the Soviets. Germany's war effort was largely economically self-sufficient and did not depend on international trade. For those resources which Germany did not possess, rubber and oil, Advanced technology had found exact substitutes which could be created from coal. One of the few materials which Germany needed to import for its armament industry was ore with which to produce the highest grade steels. These had to be obtained from Scandinavia, actually from the neutral country of Sweden, but via the equally neutral Norway. Britain's war of resources was dependent on free Atlantic sea trade. Shipping came under intense attack, and the battle of the Atlantic between the two navies was to become a crucial conflict of the war. For Germany's navy, the key problem was access to the open sea. Germany's coastline was short and easily closed off by the opposing British. The German navy had already put to sea before the war had broken out. Now, as the conflict extended, 
the key resource for the German Navy was to gain further coastline from which to base U-boats and surface raiders. The coast of Norway, with its fjords and deep inlets, provided a series of harbors and bases to the Germans that would enable them to threaten merchant shipping and evade the efforts of the Royal Navy to counterattack. Norway and Sweden were countries walking the tightrope of neutrality. In a war which depended on internationally traded materials, it would be increasingly difficult to remain neutral and have neutrality respected. If Germany violated Norwegian neutrality, so did Britain and France. At the same time as the attack upon Norway, the Nazis turned against Denmark. Denmark had remained a neutral country in every European affair since 1815 and was accepted by all powers as part of Germany's backyard. Denmark was, by nature, pacifist in politics, with the military held in low regard. In 1940, the Danish army was just 14,000 strong, the navy just five ships, the air force 50 planes. The invasion of Denmark began at 4.15 a.m. on the morning of April 9th. The Danish government capitulated just one hour and 45 minutes later. Denmark was attacked because it was in the way, an innocent bystander in the path of the attack upon Norway. All the countries that were to come under occupation in the war had to choose how to deal with their conqueror. Denmark chose the path of least resistance. As a result of the capitulation, the Danish government retained power over Denmark's internal affairs. The price was what some call collaboration. Yet, it was a policy supported by elections. For the Danish population, it was a recipe for survival. Norway had hoped to remain neutral. Although a country comparable in size to Denmark, its armed forces were stronger, and the country was to provide a stronger resistance to the Nazis. Norway had its own Nazi party, and its leader, Vidkun Quisling, was installed by the Germans as president of the occupied Norway. His name was to become synonymous with treachery and collaboration as he tried to impose a Nazi system on his country. As the Germans mounted their invasion, their troops embarked, their aircraft and ships fueled and armed, they were taking part in a carefully planned operation to grab resources needed to further fight the war. History conceals from us the confusion endured by both sides in 1940. If there is a lesson of military history, it's the way in which the most extensively planned operations simply do not turn out as planned. The fighting in Norway became caught up in just such confusion. As the German forces sailed up the coast, they encountered British forces, not a defense. They were involved in an offensive operation of their own. There had been intensive pressure in Britain to end the phony war, to do something. Britain and France had decided, unbeknownst to Germany, to lay mines in Norway's coastal waters. The aim was to force German shipping out from Norway's neutral waters into the open sea, where they could become victim to British destroyers and submarines. The mining operation ran into the German invasion. Hastily, the British revived the plan to occupy Norway. It was planned badly, poorly controlled, and from the first to last, an operation conducted in a climate of confusion. The action started badly. Units embarked on ships, got off their ships, were ordered back aboard, leaving behind their heavy artillery. An amphibious operation, it was planned by admirals and generals who so jealously kept their independence, they traveled on separate ships. The fighting was to be amongst the subarctic mountains and fjords of Norway, yet ordinary British infantry was pitted in combat against special mountain troops of Germany. Troops were sent without anti-aircraft units, only to be subjected to bear constant Stuka attack. 
Despite some determined action by the Royal Navy, after having been initially caught off guard when British destroyers completely devastated a large force of German ships, the poorly equipped and organized British troops were pounded from the air and driven to constant retreat by the mountain troops, led by some of Germany's best generals. After just two weeks of fighting, the Germans were in complete control of the south of Norway, and British and French troops were undertaking the first of what were to be a series of desperate evacuations by sea. Churchill's habit of proposing wild strategic adventures on the fringe of war at its very worst. It was a habit which had caused his downfall once before. In World War I, just such a similar venture into Turkey at Gallipoli had caused the deaths of many thousands of British troops. And since many of those troops had been from Australia and New Zealand, had even threatened the British Empire. Fear and hesitancy that Gallipoli was being repeated only contributed to the failure of the Norway campaign. The combination of the utter surprise which the Germans managed to effect and the chaotic organization of the British and French forces meant that just such a fate may have again awaited Churchill. Instead, the events in Norway were to project Churchill to the height of power that a disaster that might have consigned Churchill to the footnotes of history catapulted him to a paramount position proves such a thing as destiny exists. The timeline of the war is a complex weave of events of cause and effect tangled together. Already elsewhere in Europe, the war shifted into a higher gear. A picture was being drawn upon a bigger canvas as the German invasion of France and the Low Countries began. Yet, in Britain, the chain of cause and effect that spread from the Norway campaign was still to play out. The government had been led by Neville Chamberlain. Chamberlain has earned an unfortunate place in history as the principal architect of appeasement, forever to be associated with the Munich Agreement that had consigned Czechoslovakia to oblivion, with promises reneged and trust betrayed. Chamberlain, in fact, only represented the views of nearly everyone in Britain and her ally France. Chamberlain's fault was to take Hitler at his word. He has compounded his fall in the eyes of history by a series of dramatic speeches that were all too quickly to be confounded by events to the discredit of the man. On his return from Munich, describing a meeting with Hitler where the dictator had made a vague agreement never to go to war with Britain, Chamberlain had waved a single sheet of paper and famously promised peace in our time. A principled man, Chamberlain had been devastated by the outbreak of war, seeing it as a failure of his political life. The conduct of the war, its phony nature, was as much a product of Chamberlain's clinging to a desire that somehow a peace might be grabbed, even at that late stage. While Chamberlain led Britain, no bomb ever fell on German territory. After six months of the phony war, on April 6th, as the Germans were leading their invasion fleet for Norway, Chamberlain had made a speech where he famously declared, Hitler has missed the bus. Chamberlain confidently predicted victory, arguing that Hitler had failed to act while Britain and France were still arming for war. Once again, Chamberlain's words were soon to be ridiculed by events as the war began for real. A debate in Britain's House of Commons was called to discuss the Norwegian campaign. The House met for two days in continuous session. Member after member rose to criticize Chamberlain. 
aged war heroes came to the house in uniform and medals and stood in condemnation. Famously, Leo Amory, one of the most senior members from Chamberlain's own Conservative Party, quoted words from Oliver Cromwell, spoken in the House 200 years previously. Pointing at Chamberlain, he said, You have sat too long for any good you have been doing. Depart, I say, and let us have done with you. In the name of God, go. A vote followed. Chamberlain's party deserted him, and the government's majority of 200 was cut to 81. The result stunned Chamberlain, and, visibly shaken, he left the house with chants of go, 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 resounding in the chamber. Chamberlain, in fact, did not relinquish power easily. He asked the opposition parties, principally the Labour Party, to join a coalition government. The Labour leader Attlee refused, saying Labour would only serve under a different Prime Minister. Chamberlain held a meeting with King George VI, Churchill, and the most senior minister, Lord Halifax, who was Britain's Foreign Secretary. Halifax was the choice of those in government to succeed Chamberlain. The King asked Halifax to form a government. Halifax declined. Uncharacteristically, Churchill achieved his life's ambition by remaining silent. Churchill was chosen because of his dissociation from the politics of appeasement. He alone, of politicians outside the central establishment of British politics, had an arsenal of political and strategic creativity, coupled with instinctive, innate and powerful talent for the game of war. He himself later remarked on his taking office, I thought I knew a great deal about it all and I was sure I should not fail. As he became British Prime Minister, Churchill regarded himself as fulfilling a personal destiny. Churchill's rise to power was the last act of a course of events started by the fighting in Scandinavia. of RAF officers. He forbade sending more units to France, reasoning they would be fighting a lost cause. These planes had a place in another battle, the Battle of Britain, that was to follow. Churchill was a natural leader, a natural strategist, but in those first days he was incapable of influencing events. Already, history was swirling about Britain, her leader and her people. History which was already swamping Britain's French allies under an avalanche of war. Next time on World War II, The Complete History. The population of Europe comes to yearn for the years of the phony war. As all expectations of victory, all predictions of how things will be, are wiped away in weeks. As the German success in Poland is repeated and magnified by a new, ever greater blitzkrieg of armored war. The Maginot Line is bypassed, and the British and French armies are drawn into a simple German trap, cut off, surrounded, with their backs to the sea. The British are evacuated by an armada of small boats. In the miracle of Dunkirk, the army is saved to fight again. The Germans swing south and destroy France. The ancient dominant power of Europe is defeated in weeks and forced into humiliation of surrender by a vengeful Germany. A weary and defeated France descends into a hell of occupation and the shame of collaboration. Britain now stands in its direst hour, alone, weak, separated by only 20 miles of sea, 
from her Nazi enemy. The people of Britain experienced the terror, the fear that other European powers have endured. The fear of invasion, of subversion, of occupation. Invasion and attack is expected. Every desperate reserve of improvised defense is deployed. Hitler offers peace once more. The reply from Churchill is of pure defiance. To fight on the beaches, to fight on the streets, to never surrender. <laughs>